And this is a 47-year-old female. Unlike the three prior cases, this is a patient who has had previ previous surgical intervention. So known congenital heart disease, two operations early in life, and here's her chest x-ray. And electrocardiogram. And let's look at just a couple of echo features on her. And then I'll ask you a question, a couple questions. So non-Mayo format, TR velocity 2.7. And so first question, what valve problem is likely causing this finding, the finding that you see on this parasternal short axis view? Is it mitral regurgitation, aortic valve stenosis, tricuspid valve stenosis, or pulmonary valve regurgitation? Excellent. Fantastic. So what we see is right heart enlargement, and so the only answer that could be is pulmonary valve regurgitation. And so what is the most likely diagnosis that required repair in this patient? Tetralogy, coarctation, congenitally corrected transposition, or detransposition of the great arteries? And these are patients that you will see in your echo lab for sure. Excellent. Tetralogy of Fallot. Really, really excellent. So just a refresher, and I don't know that we need to answer this question because you did so well. So here we see in this patient a really striking example of pulmonary valve regurgitation. So I won't ask you to vote on this, but it's so brief that it's hard to actually see it. And you can see how brief it is um, in this continuous wave Doppler signal. So rapid upstroke and rapid deceleration to baseline. And so it's often missed. Even in our own lab, this can be missed. Not in the congenital lab, because we we're looking for it, but in the adult lab, in the patient who doesn't have repaired tetralogy, we can miss severe pulmonary valve regurgitation because one doesn't recognize this absolutely uh, classic continuous wave Doppler signal. So as we go back to the patient's chest x-ray, there are clues to the diagnosis on the chest x-ray. And those include what? What about the aorta here? There's a clip there from a prior blaylock taussig shunt. And so this is characteristic, as you already alluded to, of tetralogy. So she had a right blaylock taussig shunt at 18 months of age. And then as was done in the in the previous era, tetralogy repair at age three uh, years. She had no symptoms. And again, since we're running just a little bit short on time, maybe I'll skip ahead and not ask you this question. Um, but she has severe pulmonary valve regurgitation and as you noticed, significant right heart enlargement. And so we need a little bit more information to determine what to do. And so she went on to have an MR and you can see here that the right ventricle was markedly enlarged. The end diastolic volume was indexed to body surface area and was 161. Is the absence of the retrosternal airspace here consistent with really marked right heart enlargement? And as we go back to the MR here, you can see how this is the sternum and here's the right ventricle. I mean, it's really very, very large in this patient who's asymptomatic. So then the question is, what do we do? So we exercised her. She was, um, uh, as I said, um, had no symptoms and wasn't completely convinced that she needed anything done. And you can see here, not only was she asymptomatic, but authentically asymptomatic. Exercise over 100% of predicted, both time and peak VO2. And so then let's ask you, what would you suggest for this patient? Pulmonary valve replacement, continued observation, or not sure. Good. 
Good. Will, what would you do? Yeah, I think the RV is quite large. I think it would be hard not to operate. Um, and then the scut off of 150 or 160 has been shown to correlate with lack of improvement in RV size and function after PVR. So in other words, if you do it too late, the ventricle doesn't perk up afterwards. Yeah, and so she was referred for surgical pulmonary valve replacement. I think at the time that uh, she presented, um, the uh, percutaneous options were um, limited. Um, so remember, tetralogy consists of, as we know, four things, but it's really anterior or cephalad displacement of this conus septum that causes right ventricular outflow tract obstruction and secondary right ventricular hypertrophy, and then, of course, also that subaortic BSD and aortic override. And surgical intervention, even to date, includes most commonly patching the right ventricular outflow tract to relieve obstruction, therefore rendering the pulmonary valve incompetent. And so although that's tolerated very well early in life, you can see that ultimately patients develop progressive right heart enlargement, annular dilatation, and eventually, um, if left long enough, tricuspid valve regurgitation uh, is, can also be seen. And this increases the likelihood of arrhythmias, right heart failure, and so on. So any patient with repaired tetralogy of Fallot who has cardiac enlargement, arrhythmias, symptoms, cardiomegaly, um, right ventricular enlargement, or tricuspid regurgitation, always look at the pulmonary valve. Really, any patient with repaired tetralogy of Fallot. And then looking at the guidelines, as uh, Will's already alluded to, this is a patient that we would recommend intervention, and it's in the small print here, but patient clearly meets criteria for intervention. And although there's a lot of discussion about optimal timing intervention, I think everybody would agree that this patient uh, qualifies. And so she underwent pulmonary valve replacement, and just to emphasize um, that um, the learning objectives here are to recognize the common postoperative sequelae related to repair of tetralogy of Fallot. And then also just to review the indications for intervention. So take home points in post-op tetralogy. Severe PR is the most common late problem. Dyspnea, arrhythmias, right heart enlargement, cardiomegaly, and TR, think pulmonary valve regurgitation. And then pulmonary valve replacement indications are involved, evolving in this patient population.